Praise the Lord, everybody.
Jesus. <clears throat> oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Say, whoa, 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 this Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, praise his holy name. Jesus. <coughs> Jesus. Whoa, 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 Jesus. Hmm. Oh, Jesus. 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 Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, they recorded it to see Jesus. Mm. 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 Oh, Jesus. Woo. Now, this is our record. You have started something. We thank God for what you started. Yes, Lord, we thank him. We thank him. Don't put the fire out. We thank him. We thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> oh, Jesus. Want to say good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. <clears throat> you know, woke up this morning with Jesus. All through the day with Jesus. Can't stop praising his name. Just got to always give him his due. Because he don't have to. He don't have to do a thing for us. But I thank him every day. <clears throat> you know, I used to say, God gave me all these kids so I could stay on my knees. Well, I'm still saying that. I got all of them, the grandbabies, to stay on my knees. But I thank God this morning for a brand new day. I want to read Jeremiah 29 and 11. He said, For I know the plans I have for you, declareth the Lord, plans to profit you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope. Say it again, give you hope and a future. That's it. Don't all, you don't almost need to say no more. He done already told us what he was going to do. And one thing about what he tells us, it's already done. All we need to do is say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, because you are already here. <clears throat> I come to invite you, to, to invite you in, but you are already here. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're going to do, Jesus. Oh, God, we thank you. And, Father, we just want to say thank you this morning. Lord, we don't want to ask you for nothing. We want to thank you, Lord, because you came in with us. You didn't stay outside these doors. You came in with us, Heavenly Father. So whatever the ones that are sitting in these pews stand in need of, Heavenly Father, you already got it. They already got it. All they need to do is say, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. That's all they need to do is say, thank you, Father. Thank you for waking me this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for putting the roof over my head. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Oh, Jesus. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, thank you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. You know, we could get up and just go home. Because God is doing and done done what he intended to do. 
Thank you.
Sometimes we forget about how far God has brought us, how he's kept us, how faithful he has been to us. I don't know about you, but he's brought me a mighty, mighty long way. And I'm grateful. This morning we are in Ephesians. And we are going to read the third chapter, the 16th through the 19th verse. Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. And there, these words are recorded. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And I just want to use as a topic a heart for God. A heart for God. A few years ago, on a Sunday morning, I was getting ready for church. And I was in my closet and I, I bent down to pull my tights up. And, and as I was standing up, a sharp pain went up the center of my back. And I leaned up against the wall and, and I called for my, my baby. I called for Ryan. I told her to come on into the room. And I walked out the closet slowly and then I just laid on the floor in my bedroom. Initially, I thought that it was just a little catch in my back, and, and, and I asked Ryan if she would just massage my lower back where I felt the pain initially, but I could not feel exactly where that pain was, and thinking that just maybe it had subsided, I went to get onto my hands and my knees and tried to get up, but I couldn't move. 
the pain was so excruciating that I had to lay back down on the floor. And Lee was out of town, so my girls called my sister, and my best friend was there in town visiting with us, and, and they called my brother too. And all three of them could not get me up out that floor. And I have to admit, I was a little bit embarrassed because they had to call the ambulance because I couldn't move. But once I got to the hospital, I, I watched the numbers of my heart monitor increase whenever the pain intensified in my back. And one of the nurses came in and she put her hand on my knee and she rubbed it and she said, I need you to relax. And she put a little medication in my IV and for three days, I underwent tests, and it was not until the evening of my second day that, that my heart stabilized, and, and I was able to get up on my feet, but I couldn't quite feel my feet. All I felt was like this tingling feeling in my feet, and, and then finally, the orthopedic doctor came in, and he began to discuss a procedure with me that would temporarily fix my issues and my back. And without hesitation, he looked at me and he said, Mrs. Mayberry, you have got to build your core. If you don't want to go back to surgery, you have to build the muscles in your stomach. And those muscles, once they're built in your stomach, they will support that disc so that it will not slip out anymore. Now, having five children, I don't even know if I still have no muscles in my stomach. But what I learned was the hard part was not the pain that caused me to be hospitalized. The hard part was building my core. You see, my mind and my body, they had to work together in sync if I would overcome my problem. I had to strengthen my mind and my muscles if I was going to get better. So I began to work out and train, and, and I had to, to let go of some food and some drinks that I once loved, and I had to prepare my mind See, I was accustomed to doing things in a certain kind of way for so many years that it was, it was extremely hard to do things differently. And it's this specific incident that came to mind as I was preparing the sermon this morning. God reminded me that it was not until I was in agonizing pain and I could not get up on my feet and that I had to be transported by an ambulance and had to have a stay in a hospital before I decided to do things differently. God showed me that I had to build up my core to stop my pain. And not only did I have to build up my stomach muscles, but I had to follow the plan to ensure that my heart stayed strong. See, I had to take better care of myself, of making sure that my heart was healthy. The heart is the major muscular organ in our body. It is imperative to have a healthy heart. We need the full functionality of our spines. It is all our core areas. We know that the foods we eat, the lack of exercise, and stress contribute to the poor health of our hearts. And without a healthy heart, we cannot operate fully, and it affects the rest of our body. Now, yes, we all know that we should be exercising and eating right, and I personally still struggle with it. But we know that it's something that we have to do. But for the sake of this morning, I don't want to talk about our physical hearts. I want to talk about our spiritual hearts. 
The wisdom writer in Proverbs 4, 23 wrote, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. And then he added in Proverbs 23 and 7, For so as he thinks in his heart, so he is he. But in both the Old and the New Testament, the word heart is used to refer to the whole innermost part of a man, not merely the emotions. So I want to talk about us building and strengthening our spiritual heart so that our innermost self is strong and it's loving, it's submissive to the ways of God, and we're able to follow the will of God. That we are kingdom vineyard workers, so that we trust God and depend on him and serve as an instrument in his hands as he reconciles the community unto himself. And for some of us, our spiritual health, our spiritual heart is unhealthy. See, some of us are living physically fit, but our hearts are not spiritually healthy. Our spiritual hearts are not right. We are physically eating balanced meals, but our spiritual heart is not right. So we need a spiritual diet that strengthens our heart to the will of God and love for our fellow men no matter what our differences may be. See, this was the situation in our text. The spiritual hearts of the people were not centered for Christ. The Jews were accustomed to being the sole source of divine revelation. And they were staggered at the discovery that heaven extended its favor to the outcast, the heathenist Gentiles. And the Gentiles, on the other hand, were proudly trusting in their intellectual activity and the search for truth. And they greeted with wonder the revelations of Paul. It was too much for the people of God to believe that he would embrace a people other than his chosen people, Israel. How could their God accept a people who did not receive him as their God and did not hold to the same standards and laws? How shocking it was for them to learn that Paul was to preach among the Gentiles, to make all to see the fellowship of a mystery that God had hidden in his mind that was now accomplished in Jesus Christ, that Christ might dwell in their hearts through faith and by them being rooted and grounded in love may know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, that goes far and beyond their desires and understanding. You see, it was going to be a spiritual heart change. It's going to be a spiritual heart change for the body of believers to accept a God for all people. And at the core in this time was a division in a land of Roman influence of who was a Christian and who was not. And then comes Paul, a newcomer, a man who once persecuted Christians because he thought that's what God wanted him to do. And one day he was traveling down the road to Damascus and he has an encounter with Jesus who asks, why are you persecuting me? And he lost his sight for three days. And being humbled by the experience, he had a heart change. 
And after Ananias prayed for Paul and the restoration of his sight, Paul is given an assignment. And he becomes a devout follower of Christ. He becomes a new man of Christ with a purpose, but it was not without suffering. See, Paul went through a lot after becoming an apostle. He knew his journey on earth, especially his spiritual journey, would be impossible without fully embracing Jesus in his heart. You see, we can't just hold on to the gospel void of the spirit of God. I'm going to say that again. We cannot hold on to the gospel void of the spirit of God. God must create in us a clean heart, a renewed spirit. You see, we can be the best preachers. We can be the best Sunday school teachers. We can be the best youth leaders and the best leaders. Know the word inside and out. But without the spirit of the Lord in us, without committing our whole heart to God, without living in Christ, our living in and work of the Lord is in vain. You see, we need a more profound connection. And as preachers, we must connect spiritually and get out of God's way. We can't do things the way we want to do them, but as God instructs us to do them. And as preachers, teachers, and leaders, if we are not living out the faith that we preach, that we teach, and that we lead by, we are living and working in vain. You see, in life we get so accustomed to doing things a certain way, and it's hard for us to think about doing things differently. See, when challenging times come, we, we, we fall apart. Our marriage is struggling, so we give it up. Kids don't act right, we put them out. And the church don't preach what we want to hear, we leave. Like Paul, we need a change of heart. When people doubted Paul, put him in prison, abused him, he didn't go back to persecuting Christians. Instead, he strengthened his heart, his core, and he kept preaching, he kept teaching, he kept preaching, he kept teaching, he kept preaching, and he kept teaching the gospel. The gospel is the privilege of the grace of God. Distributing his grace and mercy to fallen man and Christ's work, life, death, and resurrection is the author of it. The grace offers us pardon and glory. The exemption was given to Paul for the benefit of humanity. It was to trust. It was our trust that was committed to him by the will of God not by a power of his own exemptions. Paul carefully conformed to the order from which the church instituted, in, from which the Christ instituted the church. And in our text this morning, Paul prays for the church. He prays for their inner being. He prays for their core muscle, their spiritual heart. And then the first thing Paul prays for 
is their strength. This prayer for strength was for spiritual strength, not bodily strength, not civil power or worldly distinction. It was for the grace of fortitude and patience. See, Paul knows all about a deceptive heart. He knows how a deceptive heart can be that will allow us to walk back into some situations that God has already delivered us from. And it causes us to believe some things about ourselves that God did not say. Paul knew that when our spiritual strength in God fails, we are weak to fight against the enemy. So he prays. He prays for an indwelling Christ. Because when we unite with Christ by faith, so by faith he dwells in our hearts. But Paul doesn't stop there. He prays for establishment in love. True love is rooted in the heart. It is a spiritual affection towards Christ. Its fruits are love toward men, imitations of Jesus' example, obedience of his commands, zeal of his honor, and diligence in service. Paul goes on to pray for an increased knowledge in the love of Christ, the love of Christ that passes all known examples of love. It passes our comprehension in death and length. But it's this kind of love that all saints know. Because when they were sinners, it was the love of Christ that brought them out of the valley. When everyone else turned their back, when, that, when nothing else they tried worked, the love of Jesus set them free. Those who allow Jesus in their hearts, they know an influential knowledge, an absorbing knowledge of the love of Christ. For the fullness of God, they have such a supply of divine influence that will cause them to abound in knowledge, faith, love, virtue, and good works. And then Paul prays that the love of Christ passeth knowledge. The love of Christ who gave his life, that he would endure the cross for us, not for fame or for honor, but so that we may have the right to the tree of life. When we as Christians realize that Christ, all that Christ went through on this earth, we know we cannot continue to live life as we once lived it. After we come to him, we can no longer be who we were. It was him who kept us. It was him who kept our enemies away. He let the sun shine through our cloudy days. He wrapped us in the cradle of his love when he knew we had been battled by the storm. If it had not been for the Lord, if it had not been for the Lord, you see, my heart had to change. I grew up knowing the Lord. I, I was raised in a strong Christian foundation. I was living a fit life, eating all the right foods. I knew the word of God. I know the word of God. But it wasn't until one day a sharp pain ran through my body and I could no longer stand on my feet. I fell prostrate on the floor, screaming in pain. The Lord sent me. He sent for me to come to his hospital. 
he let me rest there for three days. And right before he began the procedure on my heart, he told me to strengthen my core so that my soul would be supported. God changed my heart. He gave me a heart for him. And every now and then, when, I, when, that, when my back begins to get tweaked just a little bit, the, my core begins to get tweaked. When I feel like nothing is going right, when I feel lonely in my heart, when I feel unheard and unseen, when I feel like I need to fix it, when I feel like I want to give up on my job, my husband, and my kids. When, I, when, I, when I'm thinking about all the things I want that God has not given me just yet. When I feel like I don't want to do this anymore. I immediately run to the throne of God with thanksgiving. I pick up the word of God and I began to pray and I study and I meditate I build my spiritual core it's a process you see it's something that you gotta continue to refine it has to be nurtured it has to be exercised Church, do we understand that we have the ability to serve people? Do we understand there is a hurting world out here in need of a savior? Think about it. Think about it. People are sick and don't know if they're going to get well. People have lost loved ones. People have lost jobs. People can't pay their mortgage or their rent. People have lost their homes. People are hungry and don't have anything to eat. People are scared while driving black. People are lonely and desperate for companionship. People are unsure of their marriage. Children are seeing their parents in a scary state of mind. Seeing their parents not knowing what they're going to do next. Losing their parents to drugs and alcohols. Parents are walking away from their lives. Seeing their parents cry because they feel defeated. Children are resorting, resorting to evil ways, trying to help their parents provide for the family. The government is more interested in playing politics instead of helping and saving people. The church is unsure how she is to address the many questions that are coming. The church is struggling how to define the loving God who cares for his children in the face of all the hurt and loss that the people of God are experiencing. How can a loving and caring and all-powerful God allow his people to suffer like this? Church, can we see the opportunity to help the people of God work through these adverse situations is now. Do we not see that God has placed in our hands the healing balm that the Gilead of this nation stands in need of? Do we not see that this is not the time to sit silent. This is not the time for us to be confused in what we believe. Do we not see that this is the opportune time to preach and teach love and peace? This is the opportune time. This is 
is the time to preach and teach the awesome grace and mercy of God. This is the time to help some young boy or girl learn how to believe in God and to hold on to God. This is the time to help parents not give up and help provide that which they need to take care of their family. Church, we don't see that God is doing a new thing today. Yes, he is the same today. As he has always been. Yesterday and tomorrow, God will not change. But he is moving today like he has not moved before. Doing some things today that he has not done before. In the old song, glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. God is fulfilling his purpose. The plan he put in place at the beginning of time is marching on. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I admonish us today to stand up and be the church that is needed in these times. Our loved ones and friends need us. The world needs us. The political world needs us. The community needs us. The church needs us needs us. And most of all, God wants to use us. Join me today in committing to being used by God. Let's sing and live the song. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. And you know what? If no one joins me, I still will follow. If no one joins me, I still will follow. If no one joins me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I want you to join me today. Will you make this commitment to God today? Let's get our hearts right with God and join his army right now. Oh, for I, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, thy weary one, lay down. Thy head upon my breast. So I just came to Jesus, just as I was. Weary, worn, and sad, but I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, we worship you this morning, Father God. We want more of you, God. Hallelujah. Wherever you are this morning, we want you to know that God is with you right there in your room, right there in your car, right there wherever you are. Come on and lift your hands and let's worship you this morning.
Let's thank our pastor for that word on today. Amen. Amen. This afternoon, we have been praising God today. It is a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. Just an extension and our call to discipleship, we want to extend a hand to you. If any way we may be a help or guide in your life to lead you to a God, You've heard the word come forth. You heard the blessings of how God changes one's life. You may be that one he's calling today to say, get your house in order. Get your marriage in order. Your relationship with your children in order. Yeah, your job, your finances, your home in order. God is a good God. He has a hand extended to you on today. And we here at Antioch Baptist Church would love to be a support to you, your family, your situation, whatever it is you stand in need of. Our pastors would love to hear from you. Pastor Marla Mayberry, Pastor Andrea Chambers would love to hear from you and see why, how we might support you in your life through your ministry and through your serving to God. God is a good God, Antioch. However we may serve you, and if it's a call to worship, if it's a, a change in your life, making your commitment to God that you want to serve him, you want to rededicate, yeah, you want to be baptized, whatever it is you stand in need of, we here at Antioch Baptist Church would love to serve and help you in that way. God bless you. Amen.
It is now time for altar call. I want to read Matthew 11, 28 and 29. It says, Come to me, all you who are weary and hungry, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am gentle and humble and heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. And that is so true of the Lord. That's so true. Because he'll take on what 2020 has left us. He took it on in the beginning. But 2020 seemed to be kind of following us a tad bit. But like he said, his yoke is easy. He can do more for us than we can definitely do for ourselves. I don't know about you, Pastor Moeller talked about the core. <laughs> and I tell you, I'm like her having five children kind of leave you a little weak. But if we take on this scripture that has been read, read today, Matthews 11, 28 and 29, if we give it to him, because no point in us talking about, oh, it's going to be our, no. Only way it's going to be all right if we trust God for it. That's the only way, because I'm going to tell you something. I, I listen to a lot of people include myself, we talked about Donald Trump and we said a whole lot of little ugly things about him. But you know what? He was a blessing. He really showed us what this country was all about. That's what he did. He just brought out the truth, you know. And, 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 and so with what we as godly Christian people need to do is what this verse said, Matthew 11. 28 and 29. Make sure we take it all to Jesus and lay it at his feet. Because if you're like me, I remember Reverend C.L. told me one time he was talking and he said that uh, I was really crying. I really had problems. My people were little. Things were not going right. Nobody had a job or we did. We had a piece of job and we didn't have a lot of food to eat and different things were going on. But he said to take it to Jesus and lay it at his feet. He said, now do it like you do your bank account. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I just told you. I had nothing going on. But he said, you do it like you do your bank account. You take it, you deposit it, and you leave it. Walk away from it. I understood that. I understood that. So that's what I'm saying this morning. For you at home, for you that came to the altar, for you that are heavy, heavy loaded, give it to Christ. He will take it. He will help you. He will deliver you. He will set you free from all these things that hold us down. So let us bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Father, you said that if we brought it to you and that we lay it at your feet, that you would take care of it. So Heavenly Father, we come laying our problems, our burdens, our heavy loads, Heavenly Father. Father, so heavy, some days we're bowed over with it. We're so, Heavenly Father, in our minds we can't think about nothing but what's on us. So Lord, we come to you only as we know how to come. Talking to you, asking you, Heavenly Father, that you deal with our burdens. Heavenly Father, we have loved ones that are in hospital rooms right now. We have loved ones, Heavenly Father, that are in nursing homes. We have loved ones, Heavenly Father, behind prison walls. We have loved ones, Heavenly Father, 
don't know where to go, don't know how to get there. Heavenly Father, we have loved ones that are walking the street, Heavenly Father, not knowing where they are. Knowing, Heavenly Father, that their minds are gone. Heavenly Father, we have loved ones that are strung out on drugs and all this other stuff, Heavenly Father. Oh God, we got loved ones, whether it be our children, whether it be our niece or nephew, Heavenly Father, they are loved ones. Heavenly Father, we definitely want to remember those that requested prayer, Heavenly Father, on Wednesday night. For Heavenly Father, they come standing in the gap for their loved ones, as we do today, Heavenly Father. We stand, Heavenly Father, in the gap Heavenly Father, Father, we know all about you. And sometimes, Heavenly Father, we become weak, Heavenly Father. Our core is weak. Heavenly Father, help us today, Jesus. Help us to be all, Heavenly Father, you calling upon us to be. There is nothing that we can do without you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, and we thank you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, because you promised that you'd never leave us nor forsake us. But Father, we know you to be Emmanuel, God with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that today, Lord. We thank you for knowing that you are with us. So Heavenly Father, as you go before us, Heavenly Father, please, don't forget us. Never leave us, nor forsake us. Go with us, Heavenly Father. For Father, it's not unto us, O Lord, not unto us. But unto thy name we give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. And we call it all, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Will a person rob God? How can we do this, you might ask? Through our tithes and offerings. God says, bring the whole tithe into my house that I may have meat for my house. Test me in this and see if I won't open up the doors of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. I'm sure all of us can attest to how God has been faithful over these turbulent times. We thank God for how he has continued to show up in our lives and make sure that we have everything that we need. God is a provider, God is a sustainer, and we honor God when we bring our tithes and offerings into the storehouse. We thank you for how you have remained committed over these past few months. We appreciate you. We thank God for each and every member of this church, for we know that we would not be the same without you. You know how you can give. You can continue to give um, your tithes and offerings through Cash App at Antioch Baptist Tulsa. That's one word. Or you can drop a check by in the brick mailbox. You can call Paula Tees at 918-583-1620, extension 3. And she'll be glad to take your um, tithes or offerings over the phone through debit card or credit card or ACA withdrawal. Um, all of these ways you can give. And we thank you for how you have continued to give. We love you. We thank God for you. As always, we want you to know that we're here for you. Anytime that you need us, give us a call, email us. You know that you can reach us through Flock Notes or through um, Instagram or Facebook. We want you to know that we love you. We're with you. God is with you. And we'll be happy to see you again next week. Bye-bye.